I had to change my background quickly yeah. um, because, yeah, no, I teach another, I teach five one talk between my lessons. So okay. I had a seven o'clock and I had it up for the seven o'clock. Then I had to come down for five one talk. Now it goes back okay. up again. So okay. it's up and down like a yo-yo. <laughs> but now yeah, it stays up cool. until the end of my, my get set up. And then I go back to five one talk. So it's, wow. a, it's an up and down. Awesome. <laughs> Awesome, uh -huh. awesome. Okay, so you are now live. So okay, excellent. Thank you. I um, look yeah. forward to. Yeah. Thank you for the lesson. I hope everybody enjoys. <laughs> yeah, your right. TA will be here soon. Yeah, I no think. problem. Great. Thank okay. you so much, Harry. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Mute start video. Welcome to everyone who is coming to listen to the live stream today. We are going to be streaming. Uh, we're going to be starting our class in about five minutes. As soon as other people start arriving, I hope you will enjoy the smaller animals and some of the very big animals of Australia. This is the second of the series. The first one was yesterday. And now this is the second one today on animals of Australia. I do hope you all enjoy your time and I will see you all in about two minutes. Unmute. Start video. Hi, Lester. Welcome. Nice to have you in class with me. Are you my TA today? Ah, excellent. Thank you so much. I will introduce you when the others come into class. Uh, right. Thanks, you. Just, uh, ple pleasure. Uh, you are, we'll be here to queue questions. Thank you, because I often forget to see the questions coming. Just <laughs> remind I mean. me, just say to me, there's somebody asking a question yeah. Or, yeah. or that, because I've got quite a big class today. It seems to be growing by the minute. So that's Sounds also great. awesome. Mm. Yeah. This is the second one in the series. Yesterday was the first one, uh, yeah. which was the more common animals that we get in Australia. And now we have got the um, smaller animals coming up now. I just want to close my curtain. So I'm just going to close my, my video for one second. No um, will you let people in while I do that? Can Ooh. I make you, let me just make you... Um, co-host yeah yep. then yep. um you can do that i mean just stop my video for one second sure i'll go ahead and, and uh, manage the people from coming in excellent i'm back Right, I'm back. Thank you. All right. Well, 
welcome everybody that oh, I recognize the dog. <laughs> Excellent. Oh, lovely. Lovely to see you, Donna, again. Uh, Tega, welcome. Um, and Wanda, lovely to have everybody in class. This is awesome. Hi, welcome, Wanda. Um, and Tega and Donna, lovely to see everybody today. Uh, and we've got a nice big class today. Please feel free at any time to hop in and ask questions um because i often don't see hands oh welcome tega lovely to have you in as well um if you'd like to type in where you are from if you don't want to tell me i love to know where people are from so that uh we are able to um talk to to people uh, to to know where you are i i live on the other side of the world so <laughs> for me it's awesome if you want to ask a question and um you don't I can't remember how to unmute or you forget to unmute at any time just putting your hand on your space bar unmutes you straight away you talk and when you take your hand off the space bar you automatically remute it which is a nice easy way to remember how to speak and how to do lovely to see you Laurie uh, and uh, ah, Charlotte North Carolina from Tega thank you excellent uh, very nice to have you as well. Uh, and so let's see, we do, we are expecting quite a few more people to come wandering in. Hi, Linda uh, and Laurie, lovely to have all of you with us. Um, I'm going to be sharing my screen. Before I do, I'd like to introduce Lester. Lester is my TA in class. So he will keep an eye open for if you are, um, wanting to ask a question and I haven't seen your hand because sometimes when I'm talking, I kind of forget. Uh, Lester will remind me, and but please feel free to stop me at any time. I do ask at the end of each animal if there are questions and please feel free. If I know the answer, I will tell you. If I don't, I'll find the answer for you and let you know. But um, I hope that I will be able to help you with most of them. So thank you very much, Lester, for being part of the class as well. We're going to share the screen now. Um, and so everybody is then able to uh, find out a little bit Come on, talk to me. There we go. All right. Um, we are learning more Australian animals today. Yesterday, I covered the well-known marsupials, the kangaroo and the koala um, and, and the possum uh, and the, the well-known um, ones. Now, today we are looking at more of small ones. We are going to be um, looking at small things. Um, uh, great to have everybody back. Baltimore from Donna, lovely. Um, so uh, lovely to know where you all are. Ah, we are live streaming today, so people will be popping in and out with their cup of coffee to see the different animals as well. Right, let's see. Um, we learn from each other. So if you know something that I don't know or somebody asks a question and I go, um, please feel free to jump in and say, but I, I heard this or I maybe learned that. So that, hi, Mary, lovely to have you in class too. Um, uh, Thank so you. It, it, it's very much interactive. I want to, you to please take part in the class as well. Uh, if you want to just sit and listen, you're very welcome. If you're joining by live streaming, the best way to participate is to join, register a class, and then you can really take part. And uh, we're not to promote anything. In this particular class, I'm talking about animals, so it is unlikely. Um, now, a little about me. I live in Perth, Australia. I come from South Africa. I lived there for 63 years and then moved to Australia three years ago uh, in order to help look after my grandchildren. I've been an educator for 44 years. So I've 
been working with children, working with adults, um, just part, imparting knowledge that I have is something that I enjoy doing and I hope helps others to learn as well. I have a great love of animals, uh, both African and Australian animals, because those are the ones I've particularly got to know. Um, and so I, I, that is why I started the series on Australian and African animals. Um, I also love being a member of the Get Set Up Guide team. Um, I'm forever changing my presentations when I find something new or more interesting that I think people might enjoy. So let's have a look. We're doing part two of Australian wild animals from the cute, and I really mean cute fairy penguins, to the somewhat scary crocodiles. They are very scary. When you see that mouth open, you don't want to be anywhere near where the mouth is because you'll come off second best. So let's look at some of the animals we will talk about today. We're going to go from the top across, going across. The first animal is a numbat, very cute little animal. Then the cassowary, an, a bird that comes from the dinosaur time. The echidna, one of the two mammals that lay eggs, and both are found in Australia. To the little potteroo, he's very cute little face. The emu, the second biggest bird, a land, land bird, bird that can't fly. To the thorny devil of the desert. To the dingo that looks so innocent but really is a wolf uh, in many ways. Um, to, the, to the quoll, he's an interesting little animal with little spots on his back. To the fairy penguin, the, um, <clears throat> the little, oh, ba -ba 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 -ba, begins with the letter B. Oh, I've forgotten what his name is. We're going to talk about him first. And the crocodile, Busby, Bunby, because he looks like a bunny. Uh, I always want to call him a bunny. He's actually part of the um, family that, um, cross, oh, I'll tell you right now, <laughs> it's gone blank for a second. That's terrible when I go blank on my animal. The bilby, <laughs> not the bulby, the bilby. The bilby is the cutest little animal. He's got the most interesting tail. He's got tail. Then this black sort of almost looks like a bottle brush. And then the tail, white tail at the end. A very, very distinctive. And he's got the long ears. So at, at Easter time now, he is often shown in adverts for Easter eggs because he's the closest we have to a rabbit. And so he, with his long ears, he is a rabbit. Uh, they dig burrows um, and they, he was part of the bandicoot family. So he's there helping. Um, hey, we did bandicoots last time, but because he is so different, he's got these very long ears, his long pointy nose, his very peculiar tail. And they now only live in Western Australia, right up near the north. They used to be around everywhere, but they are very much um, uh, been because of the way we're using the land, they have gone further and further north. Um, so they now live very much uh, in, in there. They, they have been around for many years. They found in Central Australia, what I've done is I put a map for each animal, unless it's found all over the country, then I didn't put a map in. They are almost from the time of the dinosaur too. They have been around for 15 million years and our, all the Australian indigenous stories have the bilby in it. It is a, a, an animal with a great history in Australia. So he is really one of the most beautiful animals. He lives underground in little burrows um, and comes out mainly at night uh, but occasionally is seen during the day. Any questions? No, no questions yet. Good. Okay, now the next uh, one we're talking about is the numbat. 
The numbat is insectivorous. He is, he only eats insects. In fact, he only eats ants. Maybe he'll eat a few other small things, but ants are his thing. He has a 10 centimeter tongue. Now, a 10 centimeter tongue for a little animal is very, very long. He's only 25 centimeters himself. So he's that size. And he's got a 10 centimeter tongue. So his tongue is almost half the size of his body. And this tongue can go into the anthills and consume the ants. He eats an incredible amount of ants every day. And he doesn't need water. He gets all the liquid that he needs from the ants and termites that he eats. So those are his source of liquid. Because when you live in the desert, there isn't a, an abundance of water. And we have a big area of desert. We really do. We have an enormous desert running through the center of Australia. And so a lot of animals live there, not that many humans. Um, they uh, weigh only two kilograms, so they are, are not a heavy animal. Of course, being small, that works out about right. And they live for five years in the wild. Uh, they are eaten, obviously, by other animals, such as the, the eagles and, and the dingoes. They are, are, have a lot of natural predators, so, but they still manage to live for five years, which is pretty good. Any questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, are, are they bodies uh, immune to the ant bites? Uh, yes, yes. They don't feel the, the bites at all. They, and, and also when they're eating within their mouth, they obviously they've got sensors that, so yes, they don't worry about the ants. They can crawl all over them, but they'll still continue eating them okay. because, <laughs> because otherwise they would be able to eat one or two and then run <laughs> and then come back a bit later. They would have a very long life of doing that if they had to do it that way. Uh, yeah, yes, no, they are. Yeah, it's but, a yeah, but those tongues are amazing. If you see the length of this tongue coming out, you, it's almost like a chameleon. It goes on and on forever. Oh. Um, and so he's able to dig with that. And it's kind of sticky. So the ants stick to it. So when he takes it in, it takes in a lot of ants at the same time. It's not just one at a time. Right. Now, this is a very strange little animal. He's got such an endearing face. He's called a potteroo. He's also part of the kangaroo family. You can see by his strong back legs and little front legs. They, there are lots of animals that fit into the same family as the kangaroo. And he's the potteroo. He's the long-nosed one. There is a short-nosed one as well, but you don't get it in Australia. Uh, it's an ant. A nocturnal animal, so you don't see it very often. And um, they, they live in strange places. They live in forests, not in the trees, the over, over forest. They live in the under forest. So they live under the trees, under the leaves. So it's very, if you, you literally see it, if you tread on it, because otherwise they are pretty clever at keeping themselves out of sight for both the other animals that want to eat them and us. Um, they live five to six years and they are found in what they call the understory. That is the undergrowth of, of a forest in Tasmania and southeastern Australia. They live on the fungi, fruit, flowers, seeds, nuts, insects. So they eat anything that creeps or crawls along the ground, as well as any of the little plants that grow there as well. But a very, very interesting looking little animal. Any questions? The other important thing is that they're very solitary unless it's breeding season. So you're not likely to find a family of them, uh, which is easier to find than just one lonely little uh, Potteroo. 
Now, this for me is one of the most interesting in animals. He comes from prehistoric times. and You can see that in the shape of him and how he is. The little baby is called a puddle. And for me, I think that is just the cutest name um, for it because it, it, it's just too sweet and too tiny and too gorgeous. Um, so this little puggle, he, 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 he looks almost like an elephant gone wrong with his long nose. And their spikes are there to protect them. They are found in different areas all around Australia. There are two types. There's the long nose and the short nose. The short nosed um, echidna is about 35 centimeters, while the long nose can be up to 60 centimeters in size. And they are between three and nine kilograms from, uh, in weight. So you've got a variety of weight as well. Um, they roll themselves up into a ball so that they can protect themselves. Most things don't want to be pricked by those spines. Uh, they are actually just modified hairs. And in between those is fur. And that's what keeps the body so nice and warm. So they, they're not only spiky, they're also furry. There's a combination. Um, they live, they walk slowly, they live slowly, and they live a very long life. They are able to live up to 50 years. They come from the prehistoric time. And they are, there are only two animals that lay, that are mammals that lay eggs. The echidna is one and the platypus is the other. They are both found in Australia as natural creatures in Australia. So they really are a strange animal. And they, what happens is they lay an egg, but they lay an egg in the pouch. So they are part, they're still part of the family of um, marsupials because the egg is laid in the pouch. The egg then hatches and the teats are in the pouch so the baby can start drinking milk straight away. So it's, it's a whole little ecosystem all of its own. Um, they, uh, after, they have the most amazing mating ceremony. It is quite the strangest one I have ever heard. They, when they are getting ready to mate, they, they, it's about to be mating season. What happens is the males all come along. And they uh, follow behind her, nose to tail, nose to tail, nose to tail. Uh, and for about a month, they follow her. Then when it is time for them to, have, to mate, they put the female in the center and they dig a trench around the female. They all, the males then get in the trench and the idea is to boot out the other males. Once you've been booted out, you're not allowed back. And the last male left in the trench, she's the prize. And then they do a little ceremony of their own. Also, she, they, he has four penises and she has kind of two vaginas. And so it is a really different kind of mating compared to any other animal that I have ever heard about. So it is a very interesting um, thing that the echidna do, definitely dating back to many, many years ago. <clears throat> Any questions? How long does she stay pregnant? How long does she stay pregnant? Well, she lays the egg straight away. It's almost immediately that she lays the egg. The egg takes a few, it takes about uh, 10 days before the egg hatches. Okay. And then this little baby comes out and lives in the pouch. Um, and he does not have spikes, fortunately for mom. So oh, his spikes only start developing once he's old enough to start leaving the pouch because mum would have a very spiky time if he had spikes while he was still in the pouch. Um, yeah, so she lays eggs pretty quickly and then it takes 10 days for those eggs to mature and hatch. 
So it's quite a quick um, time that it, it works. And then the little puggle comes out. And when the puggle comes out, he's the size of a jelly bean. He's going to get jelly bean out of my jelly bean jar. He's that size. So when he comes out of the egg, he is minute. But then he lives in the pouch and continues to grow and grow and grow until he's ready to come out of the, um, the pouch. So they are very, very, very small. So it, it is such an interesting thing. It's an, it being an egg laying mammal, but the egg is in the pouch. All right. In, or any other questions before I go on? Yeah, one more question. What yes, contributes yes. to their long life? You said they live up to 50 years in captivity and maybe 45 years. Uh, in the wild, yeah. yeah. Are they live in the, because of their very good system of being able to roll themselves up into a ball. And when they're in a ball, nothing can get into that ball. You can't get uh, any other animal will get spiked and pricked and it's just not worth their while. They'll go and find some easier prey to eat. And so that their, their uh, mechanism of being able to protect themselves is really, really good. And just the, their whole lifestyle, they, you think of humans when you are on the go, on the go, on the go, your life's goes past so quickly and your lifespan's not that great. But if you are a more calm, easygoing person, everything, just let it flow, almost like the hippies of the 60s, let it flow, life goes on much more. Your body can handle it, their bodies handle it. They just live their gentle life and go their own way. And of course, as I say, when they are in any kind of danger into a ball, you don't get inside that ball, not in a hurry. So and other animals can even roll them, but find that they just won't get into that center. And after a while, they get bored. They'll play with it for a while. No, not getting my supper here. I'm hungry. And off they go. So that is why they are not as, they don't breed as fast as other animals. They only have one at a time. So they breed slowly. Everything's slow about the echidna. And that's probably why it's lasted from prehistoric times, because it just has its own way of life. All right. Now, let's have a look. Uh, oops, where are, are we at the quoll? The quoll is a very cute little animal. He's found scattered along the coasts of Australia and a little bit up into Indonesia. Um, he's very distinctive with his long nose and he, he's got this pink nose, very pink on the end. Most other animals, their nose doesn't show off, almost like Rudolph the Red Nose Ranger. He's got this pink, pink, pink nose on the end. And he, some of them have pink ears, some of them don't. Um, they're solitary animals um, and they, they tend to hunt and forage and live on their own and only meet up with others during mating season. Um, they will have a, there's no particular home of a quoll. You'll go into a bit of a, a branch that's, or a tree that's got a hole in it is perfect for them. Um, a log, underground burrows, even old termite mounds. They'll dig into the mound and use the mound anywhere that they are covered. Basically, for them, that's home. Um, they are mainly carnivorous, but they also eat fruit and vegetables at times. But they're such a beautiful little animal, I couldn't resist putting him into our presentation. Because to me, he is, he's so different. You don't get animals that look like he does. You might get a deer or two, but certainly not little animals like the quoll. He is also a marsupial. So again, carry their babies in the front. Um, I think Australia, in fact, I know Australia has the greatest variety of marsupials in the world. Uh, there are so many marsupials in Australia. 
they all come, I'm not sure whether they originated somewhere along the way and then became different animals or they were just different strains that I haven't actually looked into and maybe I should. But there are just incredible amount of marsupials. Any questions on the quoll? Such a beautiful little creature. Right. Now, the animal that is probably the most misunderstood animal, a lot of people look at it and think, oh, dog, hmm, lovely dog, nice dog. No, he is very much a wolf. He's wild. On his own, you might stand a chance, but they work in packs. And you know, anything that hunts in a pack is dangerous. So you do, dingoes and humans don't really get on. They try and give each other a wide berth. They really, um, dingoes re don't really like us and we don't, we're just a little nervous of them. There are stories of dingoes taking small children. Um, so everybody is a little careful. You do get dingoes around most of Australia. Um, there aren't any in Perth where I live or around my area, so we don't have to worry about our little dogs because they would eat a dog. Um, they are usually a reddish orange in colour. Some of them are black or tan. They did live throughout Western Central Australia in forests, plains, mountains, deserts. They basically can live anywhere. They love fishing. They go into the sea and go fishing. So you will find um, dingoes everywhere. They make their dens in rabbit holes, caves, uh, hollows, and they live in packs. They like a lion. They live in a pack. There's a whole family of them. Any of the dog families usually live in packs. Wolves also live in packs as far as I know. So any of the hunting animals live together in a pack. Um, uh, I'm saying any, I know many of the cat family do not. They, they hunt on their own. Um, there's normally about 10 animals in a pack and then they have a litter of pups and the pups look absolutely gorgeous. You'd think you could take it home as a pet, but no, they are wild. You have to remember they are very much a wolf and belong to the wolf family. Um, there's a dominant female and her mate and the dominant male is actually the pack leader, but he, like many other groups of uh, creatures, including ourselves, the male is the dominant and the female is the one who leads from behind and makes sure that things run smoothly. So she look after the pack. They, uh, anybody who steps out of line gets into trouble, gets maybe turfed from the pack for a while, they, they very much work as a, almost like a human family. So dingoes, beware. They are not a pet. As long as you realize they are a wild animal and they're not there for you to socialize with, you'll do fine with your dingoes. Any questions? Yeah. How, how are they different from uh, the pack? The uh, African dogs. Uh, the African wild dog. Um, yeah. The African wild dog is much smaller than a dingo. A, oh, yeah. a dingo um, in size is one to one and a half meters from nose to tail. The wild dogs are less than a meter. They are small. They really are, are a much smaller animal. Um, and they, they also work in packs. They also live together. But you can go for, to the parks for months and never see a wild dog. They, yeah. they keep very much themselves, do their own things. Dingoes will come into where humans are. Wild dogs in South Africa don't. They stick to, to away from humans. Um, a dingo also weighs 10 to 20 kilos. I would say a wild dog is probably less than 10 kilos. It's much, much smaller. They're also a different color. They're black and white. Um, and then they've got sort of like fluffy ears on them, the wild dog. I think okay. I've even got a photo of a wild. I'm not sure if I've got a wild dog in. Yes, I do. I've got a, a wild dog here. Um, let me just 
get you a wild dog. Um, yeah, there's the wild dog. If you can see it, that is the one. I've just got to find out where I am and where the camera is. There we go. Those are wild dogs. Those are African wild dogs. So they do look very different okay. to the dingo. Okay. I've got my calendars from South Africa when I was there. Um, so, yes, there, there is a difference between the two. Any other questions? All right. Now we're moving on to the crocodile. There are just two species that are found here in Australia. We have got um, the freshwater crocodile, which is found nowhere else in the world, and the Estuarian crocodile, which is the one that is salt and freshwater, a combination where the sea and the rivers uh, combine. They live in lakes, rivers, freshwater bodies, salt water, brackish water. They have got one of the strongest bites of all the animal kingdom, but they can't chew. They are totally unable to chew. They are only able to swallow whatever they have eaten whole. Then they swallow some rocks and then they move and they grind the food using the rocks. Their jaw does not move side to side at all. So it's very interesting that that's how they, that's why if somebody is eaten by a croc and they cut open the croc, the body's still there in the croc because it hasn't been destroyed yet because it can't chew it. Um, interesting with the crocodile and how it, it's hatching depends on the temperature. If the temperature is 32 degrees Celsius, then, um, so that would be about 8 something in Fahrenheit because 40 is 107. So if we work down a little, you would be able to get it into, um, into Fahrenheit. Um, and then if it is above that, all of the crocodiles will be male. The whole batch of eggs will all be males. If it is below um, 32, then they'll all be female. So it depends on when those eggs were fertilized and laid. That is the, whether you're going to get a batch of male crocodile or a batch of female crocodile. So interesting that temperature can play such an incredible um, role in, in the animals. The crocodiles are usually between four and five meters long. They are big. And they can weigh up to a thousand kilograms. So they are not small by any stretch of the imagination. They're very good at hiding themselves as well. If you look at the picture on the bottom left hand, right hand corner, there's a crocodile lying on a branch. Now, if you are not being observant, you could lean against that tree just to have a rest or put your hand on the tree as you're wading through the water and you would be a very interesting crocodile lunch because lying there they do disappear into the, the foliage or into even when they're lying on the ground and there's just the pebbles are different shades it's quite difficult to see them so you if you are in croc territory then you must be aware that crocs are around we had a thing on the news not so long ago where a croc was crossing a bridge from one side of a river to the other side. He decided not to swim. He decided to cross the river. So they had to close the bridge and give him space in order to get himself across the, and then down back onto the, the um, ground on the other side. So that was so interesting to see that they, they wander wherever they would like to go. Now, <clears throat> they live for up to 30 to 40 years and they are also come from way, way back. Many people say from prehistoric or just after prehistoric time. So we have lots of, although our human population is young, our animal population dates back to thousands of years ago. Very interesting that it does that. Any questions?
Okay, they had to after 80 to 90 days. Somebody asked me that last time. Right, an interesting little creature, the thorny devil. He is found mainly in the desert area of Australia, and we have a very large desert, so it's um, wonderful that he's got a place to live. And he has a, a fake second head on the back of his neck. So when uh, creatures see him and want to attack him, they go for the second head. They don't go for the first head on, on the body. And so that is his way of protecting himself. Because there is a lack of water, what he does is he gets to where there's a little bit of dew on the grass early in the morning. And by rubbing against it, it goes onto his thorns, his thorns, and they have like a little pathway through them to his mouth. So every one of his thorns, uh, horns, whatever you want to call them, has its own little path to his mouth. And all that water that rubs off any plants as he's walking, uh, if he rubs up against anything that has liquid on it, that will immediately be taken to his mouth. And so that is a very, very clever mechanism that he has in order to survive and be able to live in the desert. They eat black ants. Now, we know that ants, there are always lots of ants in an anthill, but they eat a thousand ants a meal. So there we realize just how many ants there must be out there. They outnumber the human population billions to one because here are the just one. And these little animals are small. The little thorny devil is 20 centimeters long. So he is only... 18, 19, 20. He's that size. He's small. From the end of my fingers to there, he's not a big creature, and yet he manages to consume a thousand ants at a time. So that is quite an, an, an achievement to eat that many. Uh, they can change color to blend. So they kind of like the chameleon. They will blend in according to their background so that they are able to protect themselves from the uh, anything that wants to attack them or, or you eat them as well. Any questions? Any comments about this very strange little animal? All right. Now, the most dangerous bird in the world is the cassowary. Far more dangerous than an eagle. He lives on the ground. He's one of the three walking birds. The biggest of all the three walking birds lives in Africa, and that's the ostrich. The second biggest is the emu which we find on, um, in, in Australia. And then the third is the cassowary. Now, the first time I saw a cassowary, I thought somebody had taken a pot of paint and had painted this poor creature's head because the head is a vibrant blue and then a very, very vibrant red below it. And then a horn, it almost looks like a hoof turned upside down on top of its head. And it's made of the same um, stuff as, as your nails. So it is a hoof of sorts, but that is on the top of its head. Now, its bite is not its worst thing. Its feet are. It has got incredibly big fingers with very long, sharp nails on them. And those are what will hurt you more than anything else. They are able to, first of all, kick you and scratch you. And you, it, and the scratch is so deep, it can reach your veins. So it is one of the most dangerous birds from its feet point of view. They have descended from the dinosaurs, and you can quite understand that they have by the look of the, what they look like. They, they have this wattle underneath that we get from the turkey, but it's they belong the same thing. And then their helmet. 
um, and that's on top of their head. They live in the, the rainforests and they are very important for the rainforest because they spread the seeds. So uh, they eat and then they poop and the seeds are then able to be spread all over and new plants can grow. So if the cassowary were to disappear, the rainforests would disappear too because they are the main source of germination in the rainforests. So they are very important to uh, the ecosystems. We just have to be very careful of them, particularly if we get too close. Just want to look at them from a distance and it's wonderful. Any questions? As I say, the most, well, probably the most interesting bird. Now, the other flightless bird that is the second biggest uh, flightless bird in the world is the emu. And the emu are in fact fact one of the animals that show on our coat of arms we have a kangaroo and an emu on the Australian coat of arms um, so it is an important animal in Australia this is the one time the man does more than the lady when it comes to incubating the lady lays the eggs and the man then incubates them he has to sit on them for up to eight weeks. He doesn't eat. He doesn't drink. He loses uh, two thirds of his body weight during this time. And 10 times a day, he turns these eggs over. When they are laid, they are very, very light green. And as they mature, the color of the egg changes to a very dark, rich green color. They are large eggs. They are, um, they're not the largest. Your ostrich eggs are the largest. They are that size and are equivalent of 14 ordinary chicken eggs when you open an ostrich egg. Um, this is about half the size of an ostrich egg, but still a really big egg, bigger than a duck egg, um, uh, quite, probably double the size of a duck egg. And these thing, uh, eggs turn this vibrant green. They are very fast runners. They can jump, they can swim, which is unusual for um, a flightless bird. Most of them don't swim, but the emu do. And they have, are the only bird with a calf muscle. So that's why they can run so incredibly fast. Um, they, from this pelvic structure, it helps the em to sprint at 50 kilometers an hour. Now, that's a fair speed to go. Um, your 100 kilometers would be your 60 miles, or we'd have to try do a, a, a calculation. Maybe I must do some calculations for these. And the stride is three meters long. It's, a really, it's the same stride that a kangaroo can jump the emu can run. So they both, one jumps, one runs, these incredibly big strides. That's halfway across a highway, your nine meters, three lanes of your highway is one jump of the, or one step of the emu. He really has incredibly long legs. One of the interesting things about an emu, he can't go backwards. If he wants to see something behind him, he's got to do a U-turn and go back. He can't just take one step back to go and check on something that he thought he saw. He would have to do a complete turnaround to go and look at it, um, which I found a very interesting thing. And then I started looking at other birds. Not that many birds step backwards. So I'm not sure if it's something that happens with all birds. I think, again, I must do some research on that. Right. I know that an ostrich can walk backwards, but um, because they've got those very long legs. Any questions? Okay. Now, we're getting to my final animal. This is my favorite. When I lived in Africa, we had the big black and white penguins. Very cute, very nice very smelly, but 
there, we used to go and look at the uh, penguin colonies when we were down on the coast. But here in Australia, we have the fairy penguin. They live in colonies uh, around Perth and along the bottom east, um, south coast of Australia and in New Zealand. The first time I saw the fairy penguins, I thought, oh, those are such cute babies. Where are the mom and dad? Those were the mom and dad. They only grow to a size of 40 centimeters. So just bigger than this ruler, the length of a ruler. That is the height of a fully grown fairy penguin. The little baby fairy penguins are too adorable. They're about that size. Um, and they tootle around and uh, run around. They are just too sweet. On one of the little islands, just off the coast of Perth, you're able to go and see the fairy penguins up close because they spend most of their time in the water and they come in out of the water just to sleep late at night. But if they are being rehabilitated, then they are uh, uh, kept uh, at this, on this island where they are busy getting them. They, something has gone wrong. They've been hurt in some way. And some of them are actually bred while they're there, but they are then released. But these little penguins make the most amazing noises. They are very vocal. And they really do uh, make the strangest sounds. They cheep, they hiss, they bark like a dog, they squawk like a chicken, and they growl like a dog. So you hear this cacophony of sound coming out of all the different ones uh, as they are playing. They have a central area that you could walk around and watch them playing, and they are too delightful for words. They are serial monogamists. That means they are with the, that one bird for the entire breeding season. They may come back to the same one, but they, they won't look at another one while they are doing that. They choose their, their female very carefully, and then, the, then they do a little dance. Once they've chosen their female, they hold their arms up and they wave and then the lady chooses which one she thinks is waving the best and then they go off and do a little dance together and head off into the dunes where they will lay their eggs um, again the female lays one to two eggs at a time and then it is, it is incubated by their partner he sits on it at the uh, beginning uh, for the first several days and the female goes off to get um, a lot of food to make herself fat and then they choose um, uh, to take turns. She will sit on him and he'll go and get something to eat and then he'll go come back and she'll. So they alternate. They really do work so well as a couple. That's why they can't really have another wife because the man would be run ragged. Uh, after eight weeks, um, when the, the babies are born, they are born after 37 days, so that's um, just over six weeks, six weeks odd, they, they are born, and then they are looked after really well for eight weeks. And then the parents say, bye, they go back to the water, and they leave the little ones on their own. Now, some of them get into trouble when they're left on their own, and that's why they end up in the rehab center. But most of them are able to go down to the beach and start swimming and eating for themselves. And um, they, they will be able to they eat krill, they eat different little fish that they can find, squid, anchovies, sardines. And they stay in the water for up to 18 hours at a time, then come into land to sleep and back out again. Um, they have more than 10,000 feathers on that tiny little body. But that's because the waters down in the south of Australia are cold. We are pretty close to the South Pole. We are probably one of the closer areas there. And so we they preen and they keep these feathers beautiful with their own in, inside oils. Um, their scatter is sparkles because of the amount of fish that they eat. So it looks like fairy dust. And that's possibly why they were called the fairy penguins. 
but they are delightful little animals. You can go and to certain places on the east coast, you can go to a place called Phillip Island and you can watch the penguins coming in in the evening. Uh, in Australia, we go out to the little islands uh, just off Perth and you're able to see the penguins there. They really are beautiful. Any questions? Anybody seen a fairy penguin? No? <laughs> okay. Right. Well, that's the end of my presentation on the smaller unknown animals of Australia, or lesser known, I should say, animals of Australia. Um, I'd love to hear if you want to see more on different animals around the world. I'm considering doing animals on different continents, but I need a little feedback to find out if people would be interested in finding out about those. Um, just so that we get an idea as to what will make it a wonderful experience for you. The idea is for us to be able to share and give you enjoyment while you are listening and to learn at the same time. Uh, if you would like a copy of the uh, um, recording, you can just request it at help at get set up. Dot io. You will get that in my newsletter. I will, uh, my little email I send, it will be there. And also a link to the feedback so you can help us with more ideas. Some of the other cl uh, classes I do on animals are the first one on animals of Australia. And then I do two series on wild animals of uh, Africa. And those are both available in April. Well, this year, oh, it's April already. Um, so this month, uh, all the lessons hopefully will be up by the end of the weekend. They are going to be putting up for the whole month. So you'll be able to see if you're interested in having seeing any more. Right, I'm going to stop sharing. Has anybody got anything they would like to say? Uh, they would like to contribute to what we've been doing? I hope you enjoyed what you saw. And I, I hope you say I enjoyed it very much. Yeah, oh. I like it. They're very informative. I enjoyed it. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you, Tega. That's excellent. Um, it's lovely to get the feedback and to know that what we're planning and doing is what <laughs> other people would like to see because. Um, the, the, there's the usual ones on technology, the Zoom and the Facebook and the Pinterest and the microgreens like my husband does and things like that. Um, but I chose to go off on my own tangent as yeah. I usually do. <laughs> I do my own thing. I, 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 I enjoy learning about different animals all over yeah. the way. I love animals. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. I'm so glad you were able to enjoy it. Um, this morning I did my first boredom busters for seniors, and that was also a, a very interesting one. I do boredom busters for children, and I thought, why not for us? So <laughs> I have now introduced boredom busters for seniors as well. So it's, uh, and that was great this morning. It only went up last night and I had, I think, nine people in the class. So it was great fun um, to be able to come up with new ideas. That's my, I've got 18 different ideas that I've put up and I'm intending to put up more so that there's a variety and there's fun for everyone in different things. Mm -hmm. um, great. Thanks, Donna. Um, and uh, yes, uh, there will be more animals. Come to the African one and learn about the African animals, and then we'll go from there. Oh, thank you, everyone. If yeah. nobody's got thank, you. thank you, Mary. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. thanks, Wanda. Thanks, Donna. Thanks, Earl. Lovely to have had you all in class. Thanks, Lester, for being there. Much appreciated. Uh, have a lovely evening, everyone. And I look right. forward to seeing all of you again sometime. Okay. Bye for now. Okay. Bye. Bye.